Hi everybody and welcome to this week's episode of the Alma Mac. Today we have a pretty cool episode. We're going to be talking about wine, we're going to be talking about whiskey, we're going to be talking about coffee, a little bit about beer, and a whole lot about chemistry. But we're actually going to be leaving McMaster for this episode. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Hannah Charnock. Uh, hi everybody, today I have a very special guest, Hannah Charnock. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah. Okay. Hannah's uh, currently doing a master's at Brock University, um, originally from Victoria, where she... Originally from Winnipeg and then Victoria, but... Yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> um, undergrad at Victoria, from Winnipeg. Yes. Finally, here in Ontario. So, what kind of research do you do at Brock? Um, at Brock, I'm working uh, in collaboration with an institute that's associated with Brock called the Cool Climate Enology and Viticulture Institute. Um, so it's all looking at sort of wine science and agricultural science related to wine. Um, so my research specifically is looking at sparkling wine, which is like a hard thing to complain about. Um, and we're looking at compounds that proliferate during the aging process um, and sort of what causes those in a low temperature and low pH environment. Okay, so the institute you're in, um, I, I totally understand the cool climate part. Yeah. Is the, the V word, what was the V word? Vit viticulture. Viticulture, is that wine culture, wine That's science? That's essentially vine, vine research. Ah, um, and okay. then enology is wine research, so it's all kind of big. Okay. Term. Yeah. Cool. That's a, I didn't know that that institute was a, a thing. That's yeah, it, uh, it does a lot of sort of industry and academia crossover just because the whole Niagara region obviously having so many wineries. So it has mm -hmm. some like publicly available testing facilities. And then there's also grad students who work on research for them um, as part of sort of their Brock part. But, right. Yeah. Okay. So how did you get into that? Like what branch of science did you start in that led you to, um, you know, this sort of food science uh, wine research? Yeah, um, so I did a chemistry degree at the University of Victoria, and I just got very lucky partway through. I decided to do a co-op sort of later on in my degree, um, but I wanted to do a co-op with like one specific job in mind. There's a brewery in Victoria called Phillips Brewing and Malting Company. Um, I think it's the biggest craft brewery in BC, um, but they have a lab on site, and I really wanted to work with them doing quality control, so I just sort of sent enough emails that they finally <laughs> interviewed me, and uh, I got the foot in the door there. So that was sort of my gateway into it. Um, and it was doing a lot of um, brewing and the malting process they have on site as well. So it was looking at um, sort of just routine quality assurance within the brewery. And then there were also some research and collaboration opportunities. So through that, I ended up doing some whiskey research um, as a course, sort of like a research course for the University of Victoria degree. And then ended up starting a coffee roastery, mostly just to do some coffee science. So it just sort of led me down this path of like beverage research. So wine was like the natural next step. Okay, that's really cool. Um, as far as these different beverages go, how much overlap is there? Uh, quite a bit. Um, it's sort of within alcoholic beverages, there's a lot of overlap. You're working with yeast, it's a living organism, there's certain pathways that are obviously similar and just fermentation in general. So that part, there's quite a bit of overlap, but yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Like the work that, um, one of the projects I was working with at the brewery before I left there was looking at uh, the Maillard reaction. So it's a non-enzymatic browning reaction that contributes a lot of different flavors to many different types of foods and beverages. Um, and in brewing that comes about primarily during the malting process or the mashing process, anything that involves heat. So I was working on a project um, with the Mackendo Research Group at UVic and with Phillips. Um, and then it just so happened that there was a posting for a position at the lab that I'm currently in looking at the Maillard reaction in wine. Um, so it was like a lot of crossover in terms of what I had been familiar with, so. Yeah. Okay, um, so I'm, I'm a little bit familiar with that reaction in terms of, of coffee roasting. Um, and you make it, I mean, you made it clear that you know you're heating up the the mash and everything, and that's how you get the the heat involved in the reaction for beer. I don't. I guess I'm not too familiar with how wine works. Is there a heating process that happens? Um, There's not, and that's sort okay. of what makes the sparkling wine system unique. And it's also there. There's some. Uh, research showing that, showing that there's Maillard products in honey as well, like another sort of oh. low temperature food system. 
system, um, but they don't know what's driving it in those systems. So they've, there's been some literature in recent years that has shown that a lot of those sort of furfural compounds are present in wine. They just don't know when that happens. And it's likely due to the long-term aging process that at some point these reactions are bound to happen. There's a lot of sugars and there's a lot of amino acids and at some point okay. they'll combine. Um, but that's sort of what my research is investigating. Interesting. Uh, so maybe we can yeah, rewind yeah. a little bit um, for people who aren't so familiar with the that um, Maillard reaction. So what what do you start with? What happens to those things, and then what is the result? Yeah, it's a it's a huge reaction. Um, there's been sort of minimal work in terms of characterizing it because it's so complex, and it's the combination of sugars and amino acids, and it's a non enzymatic reaction. Um, so it's a reaction cascade, which means that there's sort of intermediate products that then can later combine with themselves or other products in solution to form larger and larger molecules as it goes along. Um, so in wine, primarily, it's sort of those intermediate Maillard reaction products are what, what they've found. Um, not so much sort of be in systems that do have heat to sort of evolve that reaction farther. So, okay, yeah, that that's actually very surprising to me that uh, you would get it in honey or wine or any of these cold processes. So I'm, I'm picturing this as like a you require a whole bunch of energy to be put into these molecules to actually have them sort of do this reaction. So yeah, it seems mysterious that that could happen without heat. Yeah, um, and like there's sort of some research showing that like maybe sort of other things in solution can catalyze or drive those reactions like potentially the presence of metal ions was what we were looking at in beer um, and how magnesium can sort of be a kind of like a cofactor in that reaction so that that might be part of how it happens in low temperature systems okay interesting yeah i uh, it's uh, kind of crazy to think that that reaction can be featured in so many different food things totally and, uh, and like all of the well, not all, but the big majority of the flavor compounds that come out of that, like whether it's like steak cooking or coffee or string, like they're desirable attributes. So in terms of something that's like so, so much a cornerstone to our food and beverage world, it's, it is kind of weird that there's like such limited research on the pathways for a lot of these reactions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess you get a whole bunch of different flavors coming out depending on how you do it and, you know, ratios of various things. Um, and maybe, I'm not sure if this is exactly what your research is in, but I'm, I'm sure that you will be able to talk about it a little bit. But uh, you see all these tasting notes and stuff on, uh, I guess, all of these products that have this type of reaction. And um, like I'm thinking coffee specifically, you'll see things like fruity and lemon and fudge and stuff like this. Things that like aren't actually added to it. Totally. Um, I guess my question is, how do those sort of come about? I mean, if you're not adding those, those, uh, is it just like a you have the same chemicals in um, the actual things that you're tasting as what you have in the uh, product? That's a very weird way of asking the question. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> that's sort of the way that a lot of research in that field is sort of framed, like in beer isoamyl acetate is a product that's formed during fermentation, and that's the exact same compound of the aroma of bananas in banana and it smells like okay. banana and beer. So there is some crossover there, but a lot of these things too, they, they smell or have different sensory properties based on what they're with. So sometimes uh, something on its own won't necessarily smell the same way unless it's with other things that can either enhance that flavor or mask it. So, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I guess the what I was trying to get at with the question is like, could you isolate individual molecules to get the individual taste but it sounds like it's much more complicated than that yeah but for the most part that's sort of the premise of it i haven't worked with gas chromatography olfactory but it's essentially rather than sending all of those compounds through to be detected they can be sort of put into a nasal port and you can smell them as they come through and that's a really common way of acquiring data in like all food science but especially in wine in order to characterize how these individual compounds taste or smell um, yeah. so they do sort of have their own distinct properties but it just sort of depends on how they're expressed or what their detection levels are in food because they can be there and they can still not matter and be at a threshold where people can perceive them so interesting yeah so so what's a, a typical day in your lab 
look like? You're typically working with actual product, like wine products, or are you, are you, you know, going a little bit more basic, like you're taking specific aspects of it, and are you working in like a very standard chemistry style lab, or does that look different? Yeah, well, you? obviously right now things look different. I'm just writing and reading all the time, yeah, but um, that's fair. <laughs> when, when lab days existed, um, I am working with finished wine. Our, de our uh, department sort of has people doing all different kinds of projects, whether it's yeast work or wine making itself, but I'm primarily looking at, um, right now my big research project is looking at how sugar type influences the Maillard reaction, because obviously the structures of glucose and fructose, or if you use um, sugars that aren't monomers, like maltose or sucrose, how those can then downstream impact Maillard reaction products. So I'm doing sort of a time course aging experiment with sparkling wine um, to look at how those different types of sugars will interact with the amino acids already present in wine. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking at, but because sparkling wine especially um, is just such a complex system, there's many different types of ways to make sparkling wine, and the one that I'm looking at is traditional method, um, where there's sort of multiple steps of nutrient and sugar additions, um, which also likely contributes to the Maillard reaction taking place because all these nutrients aren't being consumed, they're in excess most of the time, so. Okay. Um, so is the Maillard reaction also featured in like non-sparkling uh, wines? Does it happen there as well? A little, there's some literature showing that in aged wines, um, they're seeing Maillard reaction products, but in, okay. terms of, in terms of just general literature, sparkling wine has sort of been, um, at least what I'm familiar with, what it's focused on. And I think a lot of that is to do with these like desirable notes that come with expensive, bougie, sparkling wine is always like the bready, the roasted and toasted notes and some of those come from the autolysis of the yeast and some of those seem to come from Maillard reaction intermediate products so okay interesting um let's see i also noticed that you are uh, talking for pint of science canada but it looked like maybe you were talking about whiskey in this case and... i am yeah i'm talking about okay. um this past project that i did at the university of victoria um with the hoff lab and with the brewery um it's a brewery and distillery at uh, phillips and uh we were looking at ways to accelerate the aging process of whiskey it seems like my whole just career trajectory is just like trying to make drinks better faster um, but we were looking at sort of different technologies for accelerating that aging process. And one of them that we looked at was uh, sonication, which can lead to cavitation, which is sort of the formation of these really intense energy pockets of high pressures and temperatures and the ability of those to drive reactions. Um, essentially like looking at polymerization of a lot of these esters to achieve that really nice expensive whiskey mouthfeel um, that's really desirable. So. That was sort of the premise of that project. We got some really awesome data out of it. So that's what okay. I'm talking about. So I'm familiar with cavitation in terms of like uh, the pistol shrimp. Are, are you? Oh, the know this guy? Yes, I've watched that video. As the claw snaps shut, it fires a blast of bubbles. Incredibly, as the bubbles collapse, they momentarily reach the temperature of the sun. It's a good one. <laughs> yeah, those like little, I guess they're pretty big shrimp that like punch really fast and create this sort of vacuum behind their fists and that creates this big shock wave. Yeah. So that's how I picture cavitation. But um, while you're sonicating, you're creating cavitation similar to this, I'm guessing on smaller scales. Yeah, we, we sort of rigged up a flow through system, but exactly, it's on like the molecular scale um, of these cavitation pockets being formed. Um, but we used essentially the same cavitation unit that a lot of research labs use to lice cells, um, just sort of a, a horn into a, a liquid. And then we had a sort of flow through apparatus to make sure that it was all exposed. So. Okay. And this, um, in theory, sort of, it's, it might have some similar effects to aging in that it's uh, transmitting energy into the molecules faster than it would happen normally with aging, but that's kind of the, the idea you're accelerating by putting more energy in faster and like a yeah yeah way. exactly okay. and there's there's a lot of different applications of sonication it already existing in the food industry like it's used as an emulsifier for things like toothpaste and all that kind of stuff so okay. it's sort of taking technology that they know works in one setting and then trying to achieve something different with it in a okay. food industry yeah uh does this uh the sort of process happen with the bubbles in sparkling wine? Is there any connection there potentially or? It doesn't seem to be, but they are under okay. 
pressure. Like, I mean, it's nowhere near sort of the pressure and temperature um, energy impact of this cavitation, but there is something to be said for the pressure that sparkling wines under other products don't usually experience that. So that might be a factor as well. Hmm, interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can we jump to coffee now? Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I feel like I want to ask you about so many different things. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm having a hard time keeping a train of thought because you have, I mean, all of the things you study are things that I'm interested in, so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you said that you uh, you helped start up a roastery, yes. a roast, yes. roasting company. When I was in Victoria, actually, it was my uh, my supervisor at the brewery is a good friend of mine, uh, Ewan Thompson, and he's a molecular biologist. Um, and we ended up sort of just collaborating really well on a bunch of these projects with the brewery. And then we decided that we haven't had enough and we really like coffee. So um, he and I co-founded uh, Smoke and Mirrors Coffee Roastery. It was just operating as a social enterprise. We donated half of our net profits to sort of community organizations and the other half we just tried to keep our, our business afloat we're not business people we're definitely science people mm -hmm. um but it was basically just a platform to do research and then his partner karen lithgow ended up joining in as well so it was just three of us like nerds doing coffee <laughs> so we had a little uh, tagline on our bag that was roasted by small batches of scientists Right. Oh, that's cute. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's still that's still running. You can still get uh, beans. Yeah, actually, yeah, it's still operating. Um, the three of us have sort of moved on to different things, but we've left it in the hands of some like also really amazing chemists that we were friends with back in Victoria. So they've taken over the roastery and they're operating it now. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so maybe maybe you could tell me a little bit about how you started that business. Like, what kind of materials are required for roasting coffee? you need a roaster which is um okay we started just like when it was just a passion project we used a modified uh, showtime pro chicken rotisserie um oh. and there's ways to outfit those with like a drum roaster and put temperature probes in and sort of track your roast profile so we did that for a while and then we realized that the scale was just ludicrously small so we ended up uh, getting an air roasting system um, and it worked, it worked great. We had sort of roast profiles that we kept track of different for all of our bean origins, obviously. Um, so that was really great. And then we took, um, took it upon ourselves to try and debunk the myth of um, sort of at what point post roast is the flavor profile fully developed. Um, there's a lot of sort of nuances in the coffee world of is it like a week? Is it two weeks? Is it immediately after roasting? Like when is sort of the optimal uh, flavor period for that. So we did a roast, um, took samples at intervals uh, following that period, I think it was for three weeks, can't exactly remember. And then we uh, had a collaborator, uh, Blair Surge at Komotsu College, who's an amazing chemist. Um, and we froze those samples at minus 80 and then pulled them all out for a GC analysis. And it looked like within, I think it was three weeks was the time span we looked at, the flavor compounds were still increasing. Um, in those beans as volatile uh, compounds. So obviously it, even three weeks post roast, there's still the development of flavor happening in those beans. Oh, interesting. I always thought that it had something to do with, so obviously like freshness, like things will dry out and oils will dry out and stuff. Yeah. So like you don't want to wait too long. But I, I always just assumed that the waiting some amount of time after the roast was like to let things off gas or whatever, let the CO2 come out. I didn't realize that it continued developing at that point. Yeah, and that's sort of what the off gassing from the literature that I've read, they think that that's sort of what it does as that CO2 is leaving. It also sort of pushes some of these flavor compounds as they develop sort of out into the aromatic part of the oh. well, so. Okay. Yeah. So I guess the process, you start with some, some green beans, some unroasted thing, and then you just heat it, tumble it for a while. You get yeah. your Maillard reaction happening and then call yeah. it quits. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> call it quits. But no, it was, it was super fun. Like I honestly, I've never drank so much coffee in my life because I had access to it all the time and we were doing cuppings like after every roast and every week. So um, yeah, that was a rowdy, very caffeinated time, but it was super fun. That's cool. Yeah. Would you ever roast at home? Would you, what's that, that's, is that something you would consider doing? I would. I, I honestly, my coffee intake has decreased dramatically since uh, leaving Victoria in general because I have such good coffee in Victoria. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I would. It's just like the process of it, like of sourcing the beans and like feeling like you're supporting the right 
right place that there's so much research that goes into it. So I feel like it's been my life. I'm just gonna buy from the people who know what they're doing. So <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So yeah, okay. So um, you're at Brock, but you're not in the labs now. Um, and you recently started at Brock, right? Yeah, Last started in year? September. Okay. So what does your work flow look like these days from like a grad student perspective? Have you had yeah. a lot of time to be in the lab collecting data? Like, I have, yeah. So I have some stuff. I have some sort of manuscripts that I can start to put together, but not enough to have all of my data finalized for everything. So I don't know. My, my version of productivity is like different every day. So some okay. days it's just like playing Animal Crossing and then some days it's like actually oh, nice. sitting down and <laughs> writing the thing. But yeah, okay. it's, a, it's a weird weird time to navigate what being a grad student looks like. So. Yeah, I'm thinking of some of the grad students in my lab that uh, more or less just started and they unfortunately don't really have much data. So I can't imagine what they're doing. I mean, I could ask them. And I, I have asked them, <laughs> but uh, just imagine. <laughs> <laughs> so are you almost done your PhD? Is that what? Yeah, yeah. So um, before all of this happened, I was supposed to finish up at the end of the summer, nice. around September or so. Um, but uh, now that everything has to go online, um, our physics department got thrown into a little bit of a weird situation of having to design labs that students can do at home. Oof. So my supervisor offered to push off my graduation date with all the funding and stuff to December nice. and give me the job of designing these take home labs during the summer. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. So it's pretty fun. Um, it's probably a lot of work, but like. <laughs> it's fun work. So we've designed these kits They're I think they're like $5 each. It comes with like a little plastic box, um, a ruler, a protractor and a bouncy ball. Nice. And uh, yeah, with that sort of minimal kit, we're trying to get them to do a couple different labs, like energy conservation and stuff. Thanks. Yeah, so it's keeping me busy for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I feel like that's just a good skill to have, though, is to how to like take a strategy in a classroom and like apply it you know, mm -hmm. of like a less lab setting anyway. So it's probably a cool skill to learn how to do that. Yeah, I originally wanted to design it as a, a food science type thing, like pick out physics concepts and like maybe some very basic chemistry type concepts that you could do in the kitchen. Cause I feel like that's very much like a lab scenario. Yeah, for sure. But uh, yeah, that was going to take a little bit more work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you, so maybe if I can put you on the spot, if there was some sort of at home uh, demonstration or like lab that you could suggest to a listener that they can kind of do, is there anything that like, with the objects they might have at home, you could sort of do a little experiment that relates to your work in some way? Hmm. I mean, it's not an original concept, but I okay. came across a really amazing thread on Twitter. I can't remember his name, but he called himself a frumpy yeast geneticist, and he was telling people how to isolate wild yeast from foods in their kitchen. And it was this, like, fully what happens when brewers or cider makers or wineries are trying to sort of capture a wild yeast culture to then use in a fermentation. It's the same process. And it was like a really great step-by-step -step of how to sort of maintain and grow up this culture. It was really cool. And oh, then you make it out of it. So yeah, it was, it was really great. I'll try and find it and send it to you. Okay, cool. Yeah. That might also solve the problem that people are running into of not being able to buy yeast at the grocery store to... <laughs> Yeah, I know. I actually, sourdough. before I saw this cool how to make your own sourdough starter thread, I ended up just contacting a local bakery and asking if I could buy a jar of starter, and they said sure. So I cheated, oh. but it sounded <laughs> good. anyways. Nice. Uh, yeah. Okay. So let me see. Any anything that you would like to sort of plug or talk about that I haven't asked you about before uh, we sort of wrap up or not so much. The Pint of Science talk, I'm super excited for that festival. And it's really cool because they're doing a kid's um, pint of milk festival during the day and then the Pint of Science in the evening. So I'm I'm hugely looking forward to seeing what that looks like and I'm getting all of my cousins or little kids to sign up for the day events and stuff like that. So yeah, 
Yeah, that's cool. So how is it going to have, how's it going to work with uh, the whole virtual thing? Or do you have like a platform? I haven't, or? Uh, we haven't received sort of like the final logistics, but I think they're using, I think it might be called Blackboard. Um, okay. It's not Zoom, it's sort of another classroom based um, browser uh, set up for video conferencing. So I think that's how they're going to run it. But yeah, okay. it sounds really neat. They're going to do sort of like trivia sessions in between things and all that. Cool. Yeah. Have you been to the uh, Pint of Science stuff before this year, like the last year or the year before? I haven't, but I, w when I was in Victoria, okay. I heard such good things about it and I just missed it like by a couple days once I heard about uh, it. So this is sort of the next opportunity to get involved. Yeah, my my impression of it was, uh, so I guess they do like one in every major city or they try to do one in every major city. Um, but there were so many that I wanted to see in other cities that I wasn't really able to go see. I, I'm really excited that they're moving this online to some extent and I'm hoping that uh, some of it sticks like, around. About all of this, like, I mean, obviously this is a terrible situation as a global pandemic, but hopefully it just teaches us skills to make things more accessible and learn how to make everyone feel included in different kinds of formats. So there's good things to come from it at least. Yeah, have you had anything disrupted majorly? Um, aside from like lab work, of course, but like have you yeah. had conferences or anything like that canceled or? Yeah, quite a few conferences I was supposed to go to uh, this summer have been either postponed or canceled, um, as, as well as some just like the wine events that sort of happen around the Niagara region are obviously um, on hold. But it seems like a few of them are trying to incorporate different online components. Um, there's a wine conference that was down in the States that they're sort of doing a student poster session as an online um, opportunity for students to still feel like they're getting that experience and feedback. So yeah, things are, things are disrupted, but like, it's not, it's not the end of the world. I realized that like wine is very non-essential, even though we all think it's very essential. It's, like, <laughs> very essential. it's well, just for fun. So. <laughs> but the LCBOs have to stay open. Those are essential parents. Like. Yeah. That's like a health reason. I feel like fine wine isn't part of that health uh, motivation. For the LCBOs, yeah. so. I guess so. Yeah. Uh, any any winery or brewery or coffee roasting recommendations you can give us? Oh, so many. <laughs> so yeah. many. Um, I recently ordered from Revel Cider. They're in Guelph. Okay. Um, it was amazing. They do sort of wines and ciders. And yeah, I was absolutely blown away. They had a Riesling. Um, their wine label is called Ibby Wines. Um, it was delightful. And I tried to go online and order more and it was sold out. So thoughts on those um breweries i'm i'm still pretty new to sort of all the ontario stuff i haven't really had much of a chance to sort of go out and about but i had a really good uh lots of really good collective arts obviously and burdock and those kind of things but yeah i'm still just trying to try everything i'm trying not to have too strong of opinions before i know what i'm talking about so that's fair yeah Hopefully... any coffee recommendations from you though oh uh yeah so it's, it's sort of local to the area. Detour always does a really good job. They're Seen them. sort of in Hamilton yeah. region. Um, they're probably the one of my favorite local-ish. I guess DeMello from Toronto is pretty good too. They typically do like the African fruitier beans and stuff. Um, I think the, I'm trying to think other Toronto based ones. I guess the library also does a pretty good job. I don't know if they do mail order though. I know Detour does for sure. And DeMello yeah, will for sure. it's a great sure. time. Um, my uh, friend of my partner runs the Roasters Pack. So I feel like it's time that I just subscribe to having coffee delivered to my house all the time because I haven't yet. Okay. So. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I'm working through my, I guess my third bag from the Roaster Pack. So I have, to, nice. I have to do another mail order at some point. Nice, yeah, I should be getting on that. Now with staying home and everything, I, I subscribe to like the largest portion of that, uh, their program, and it's it's still really not enough, so. Yeah, once you realize, like, even food, like, I realize how much I just eat if I'm home all day. Like, I'm getting yeah. really good at eating and eat, like, cocktails, but really, like. <laughs> yeah, grocery bill has gone way, way up, but, like, eating out bill has gone way, way down, so. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'll have to do like a post-mortem analysis in a couple months and see. Yeah, like, like did I say? <laughs> expense. Yeah. yeah. 
Cool. Well, hopefully this all sort of wraps up by uh, the summer. You can do some winery tours in the Niagara region, uh, unless you've already done them. I I've you. done some, but I would okay. love nothing more. I've had my hopes set on like biking around to wineries for months now. So I'm fingers yeah. crossed, but like hesitantly hopeful. So. I mean, maybe their bottle shops will stay open. You can still bike around and. Yeah, and they are like a lot of them are doing like pull up and pick up wines or or yeah. and stuff like that. So yeah, they're definitely adapting. It seems like everyone has pivoted quite well to what they're mm -hmm. doing. Yeah, it's cool. And I guess you could always just stalk through their uh, <laughs> their fields without asking. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or working there and make my own. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks so much for talking to me. This was a uh, super cool. I'm definitely going to be tuning in for your pint of science talk, awesome. and um, maybe I'll come back at you with some more questions if you're if you're around and you're you're willing. I'm very free these days, so that sounds great. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Maybe we can yeah. uh, we can talk Animal Crossing, and you could tell me about your your farming. It's not that impressive, yet, <laughs> but it will be by the end of this. <laughs> All right. Cool. Well, yeah. Thanks for reaching out. This has been really fun.